thank you to everyone who, who has joined us today. As Sandra said, this is the fifth of a series of six webinars. And um, so far, they've been going incredibly well, and we're delighted to have so many great speakers sharing the work that they've been doing. Today, we're going to be hearing from three speakers, and I will introduce those to you in a moment. As Sandra said, we've got some hashtags for you to use, and on each of the speaker slides, you'll also see the Twitter handles for the speakers. So if you'd like to connect with them, please do feel free. Today, you're hearing from me first, and I'm going to just give you a little bit of a background and framework to, to the session, and then we'll very quickly move into our first presentation. At this point, I'd very much like to thank Sandra from NHSIQ and the team from Picker for supporting us. Without them, we wouldn't be able to do these webinars. As Sandra said, the webinars are being recorded, so for those who've been able to take part today, that's brilliant. But we're conscious that not everyone can take part in a webinar on a Tuesday at 12 o'clock. And so these will be made available for everyone on the website. And at the moment, they're up on the NHS IQ website. In terms of what we're going to cover today, we're going to be covering three presentations. So after my introduction and welcome, where I'm going to just talk to you about the winning principles in the overarching framework, I'll be quickly moving on to Dan from the NHS Arden Commissioning Support Unit. He'll look at their example of what's working well in terms of Choose Well, Feel Well, their public engagement campaign. We've got three very different presentations today. After Dan, we'll move on to Kerry, and Kerry will be sharing some of the work that they've been doing to um, look at the early res resolution in the complaints process. So Northern Devon Healthcare Trust have been doing some brilliant work, and Kerry will be taking 10 minutes to share that with us. Then we'll move on to Joe, who's actually Andrew today. So Andrew will be pretending to be Joe. Joe unfortunately can't join us. But um, Andrew will be explaining to us what the Ipswich Hospital NHS Trust has been doing around staff engagement, um, and specifically at real-time reporting. So as I said, three very different presentations. Throughout the presentations, if you do have questions, please do use the Q&A box. Um, and we will tackle those questions as, as we go. But we will allow some time at the end for questions. So um, I'm hoping that we'll have time at the end on the webinar, and with three speakers, we should have time to, to do that. If for any reason we can't address the, speak, the questions in the webinar, we will make sure that we will we'll address them after the webinar. So please do send through your questions. It gets much more exciting when we're addressing issues that come from the people taking part in the webinar. So that's the framework for today. But why these guys? Why are we inviting these organizations to share what's working well? Well, because they took part in the Penn Awards for 2014. And all the organizations who've been taking part in the webinars have been either winners or finalists of this last year's awards program. And it came through as an example of, of some feedback that we had. So in each of the Pen, Pen, um, uh, Pen Awards um, ceremony, we showcase all of the, the winners, but we have a lot of finalists who also have some great work to share. And one of the, the people who took part last year suggested that we invited all the finalists to take part in the webinars, and that's what we're doing. So thank you very much for that suggestion. So these are organizations sharing what's working well. And as we unpicked those examples, we found that there were some winning principles that ran through all of the best practice that had been put forward. And we've got hundreds of examples now in our catalog of winners and finalists and participants in previous year's awards. And it boils down to three key principles. If you look at what's working well across all of these, there are some common threads. These are not present in absolutely every submission, but when you look across them, most of them are present in most of the submissions. And the first theme is around intention and outlook. I'm going to go through these quite quickly because Louise covered them in some depth in the webinar on the 6th of October. But just in case you weren't on that webinar, the first theme is around intention and outlook. And here we see that organizations who are doing things and are managing to get the traction in their organizations are demonstrating a passion and determination that um, does not accept no, basically, um, and they continue regardless. They also make sure that they're broadening the perspective. 
This is a clear milestone where they're really looking beyond their own situations and embracing and adapting work that's happening elsewhere. And then profoundly at the heart of a lot of the work, we see that ultimately they're making things simple. They're making it and translating it into a language that people, that language that people can understand. Um, and clear communication has been a common thread through the winners and finalists. The next theme is around organizational support. You can't do it alone. Whether you've got um, passion and determination, you still need to have a culture where people are supporting you and they understand the role they have to play in improving, particularly around patient experience. You've got management who are there to support you. And management's an interesting one because um, some examples of best practice kind of do it despite the management. But when you really get the traction, the spread, the sustainability, you have a management that's supporting you. And they can't do it, of course, without the leadership. The third theme is that's very much around evidence and impact. So when we look at the organizations who've been taking part in the awards, we saw that they have managed to look and translate what they've been doing to create some evidence and demonstrate the impact. And these fall into three areas, the financial impact, the impact of actually building professional re um, relationships and spreading beyond the teams, going across other groups. And then the impact of being able to spread their work and indeed sustain it, neither of which should be understated as being key achievements. For each webinar, we've been looking um, through a lens of a, of a particular theme. And then for this one, we're looking through the lens of financial impact. So as you listen to the three presentations today, they have demonstrated against all of these themes, but today look through the lens of the financial impact, and you'll see some examples across the three presentations of how they've done this. So that's the framework, and as I said, Louise covered that in a lot more depth on the 6th of October. It's also in a, in a report that's on our website. But enough of that for today. Let's move on to the webinar itself. So as I said, if you've got questions, let us know. Use the Q&A box. When we open up the mics at the end, put your hand up, but Sandra will tell you how to do that. But do ask your questions. Tweet them if that's your preference using the hashtag there. And what I'd like to do now is very quickly move on to Dan. So Dan is going to take us through the work that NHS Arden Commissioning Support Unit have put, have put, have put forward in the awards. And Dan, at this point, I'd like to hand over to you. Uh, my name is Dan Abiziarko, and I'm an Engagement Communications and Marketing Lead at Arden and, uh, Arden and Greater East Midlands Commissioning Support Unit. Uh, at the time of the campaign, which I'm going to talk about, just to explain, um, we were NHS Arden um, Commissioning Support Unit, but we are now, we've merged with uh, GEM, Greater East Midlands, and we are now part of Arden and Greater East Midlands Commissioning Support Unit. In terms of the work of the CSU, we provide a range of communications, engagement and marketing work um, across a number of different CCGs across Warwickshire, Nottinghamshire, Lincolnshire, Bedfordshire and Derbyshire. And we also work with local councils and the third sector as well. What I'm going to talk to you um, today is about a campaign that ran over 2013-2014 across the winter. And it was our Choose Well and Fear Well campaign. And I'm just going to talk to you about kind of the background to that and also some of the overall results. So our Choose Well and Fear Well campaign was a two-phase uh, winter campaign that ran across Coventry and Warwickshire. And it was split into two distinct sections, the Fear Well element and the Choose Well element. Um, the background to the campaign that was that we were conscious about A&E departments, not only across the, uh, the country, but within our county as well, facing serious challenges as increasing numbers of people were seeking emergency treatment. With the winter period being the busiest time for health services, this, we saw that this placed considerable strain on already um, stretched A&E staff. So we took a partnership approach and we worked with our partners across the county to develop this campaign. In terms of the overall campaign, we wanted to look at um, uh, an innovative and integrated approach. So we have 
um, within the team, uh, significant experience uh, engaging with different communities. And we're fortunate that we've got um, a creative in-house communications team. So as well as um, your kind of, I guess, your box standard communications experts, we've also got a design team as well. We're quite fortunate we've got that. And they do um, design right across the complete range from um, bespoke design and also animations as well. Um, and we work with them, with, that, with that, our in-house team and our local CCGs uh, and providers to deliver um, high prof profile campaign that looked to target audiences effectively and reflected um, the changing issues faced by the health and social care providers across the area. One of our particular focuses for this campaign was the 16 to 25 year old uh, group. Um, and this was as a result of research that basically showed that we have well, we have two universities in the main area, Coventry University and Warwick University, and um, we knew that, especially with people that were new to the area, they were often unsure about where to access their local health services. And as a result of that, we saw that that led to increased um, and inappropriate use of A&E. So we have, uh, across Coventry and Warwickshire, a number of different clinical commissioning groups and local authorities and trusts. Um, and we worked with them um, in terms of developing this, developing this overall campaign. So there you'll see we have Warwickshire North CCG, South Warwickshire and Coventry and Rugby CCG. And then because we're Coventry and Warwickshire, we're covered by two different councils, Coventry City Council and Warwickshire County Council. And then we also have a range of providers, um, acute providers and also partnership providers as well. So we have South Warwickshire Foundation Trust in the South, George Elliott in the North, and we have um, a large university hospital uh, in, in the centre of Coventry. So a range of partners that we were working with. And one of the things that we decided to do initially was to come up with um, an agreed uh, logo, because we know this um, working across different partners and not just of, of uh, NHS, but obviously County Council and, and City Council, that it made sense to try and utilise one logo that we all agreed with, that we were all happy about, that we could use across all of our campaigns and all of our communications as well. And in terms of kind of giving that a name, we badged that as our uh, farewell campaign. And we also, because we've got a number of different partners, we also utilised um, Pool, pooling resources as well, because what we thought was in terms of, for example, producing print, it would be much more cost effective by, by and making sure that we all um, had a, a pool of resources. So in terms of the overall campaign, we wanted to uh, utilize a number of different media channels to try and reach a wide range of audiences. And we developed an integrated strategy that would look to maximize the impact of the campaign messages. So we utilize traditional communications as well as social media and online tools to try and capture the imagination of not only younger people, but also the wide range of people across the county. So we developed a choose well and feel well guide, and this offered tips on staying healthy during winter, as well as where and when to use health services. And this was distributed uh, via health and social care services, including GP surgeries, pharmacies, council buildings, and A&E departments. And the booklet was actually twofold. So it had two front pages. So one side was choose well, and that, as I said, gave you information about um, where to go if you needed particular advice on a particular area. And then the other side was a feel well section, just giving tips really, as I said, on trying to stay healthy. Another thing that we created was uh, an animation, Dee's A&E Fail Tale. And we aimed that at our 16 to 25 year old, but essentially um, it was something that was accessible to all really. We worked with our partners to try and get the animation across a range of different um, buildings. So we had it playing within the local hospitals on their screens and there was um, subtitles on there. So we know not all screens kind of played sound so people could still engage and understand what was taking place within the um, animation, even if they couldn't uh, hear the catchy tune that was in the background. Um, we wanted to also utilize um, the increasing and burgeoning app economy, so we developed a health sat-nav mobile app, um, because, and we promoted that primarily to, to students, but it was also available to anyone that had access to um, either of the app stores, and we had it on the Apple uh, iTunes App Store and the Google Play Store as well. 
And it was essentially a map, uh, an app that um, look, looked at your location and then would enable you to be signposted to different health services, whether that be a pharmacy, a GP, a walk-in, an A&E, dentist, or an optician. And it would present results based on your location. And we also worked with our, one of our local radio stations. And rather than have sort of traditional adverts that kind of um, were segue between, um, I guess, the music and the, and the talk bits, we worked with, uh, with Free Radio, which is the radio station, to produce a series of vignettes. And what they were were essentially the presenters having a conversation around a particular topic and then seamlessly, as they would say, segueing into um, a, a particular choose well or feel well topic. Topic. So what that enabled us to do was obviously to deliver messages in an informal and engaging way. And we also used traditional social media such as Twitter using the hashtag um, FearWell as well in terms of all the messages that we, that we put out there. One of the ways that we also wanted to do was to try and get people involved in the campaign by um, having a conversation with them. Um, I think uh, from our experience, we know that engagement works well when we tend to have a conversation with somebody as opposed to maybe um, having uh, maybe them seeing something in print or seeing something hearing something on the radio. We wanted to try and, as I say, maximise that reach. So what we did as well was go out right across um, Coventry and Warwickshire, across the county. And we undertook 50 days of engagement work and delivered across a range of venues, including gyms, job centres, hospitals, schools, colleges and universities. And just you can see a snapshot there of some of the different activities. So we had a cardboard cutout, which um, resembled a scene from our uh, animation video. And what we were trying to do was to get people to participate in that and obviously signpost them to the video and potentially maybe take a picture post that out through social media, maybe using one of the hashtags, to try and increase uh, the conversations about the uh, video. We also had a, a wire game, which you can see in the top right, the ladies um, using this wire game, which was a, uh, a choose well knowledge slash wire buzzer game. Uh, and we also, because we were conscious as well, as I said, we worked with a range of um, our acute partners across the patch. One of the issues um, that that we had in terms of feedback from them was around uh, norovirus, which I'm sure if you work in the acute sector, you're probably aware that every winter it's, it does seem to rear its head. So what we wanted to do, to do was to educate the public as well um, on the uh, how to wash uh, on to, how to wash your hands properly. And so we had an ultraviolet uh, light test, which some of you may have seen, which basically shows whether you've washed your hands uh, appropriately. And that was really just to kind of reinforce the message about good hygiene and trying to minimise the effects of norovirus. So in terms of our animation, which you can see a slide, uh, a, a screenshot from there, um, and there's an address there, which I'm sure will be on the slides when they're distributed later on. So if you want to go onto YouTube, it's, it's still up there uh, and available to see. Um, in terms of this, we, as I said previously, we aimed it at uh, 16 to 25 year olds, but it was designed to be something that could be enjoyed by all ages. So there were certain fun elements in there. There's um, a cat that um, has been taken to A&E and that sort of thing. And not really to, high, uh, to ha encourage people to do that, but just to highlight some of the um, more interesting cases that have, uh, that have um, turned up at A&E. Um, we saw that uh, university, university students were sometimes unsure of where to go for their local health services um, and that they may use A&E services inappropriately and that was one of the reasons why we tar predominantly targeted the 16 to 25 euro uh, category. But we wanted to ensure that we didn't exclude everybody. So we, we, our kind of brief was that it needs to be accessible by somebody who was eight years old and somebody who was in their 80s. And during the campaign, we had 69,000 views um, of the video. And today, we've had around 90,000 views. And one of the good things about it is that we're getting requests from other organizations to utilize um, the video. So we're happy to share that with other organizations for them to utilize, for them to certainly spread the message about appropriate A&E use. So how did we do? So in terms of, um, we've got basically an infographic there that just shows just some of the uh, snapshot of the results. So about the number of views that we had, 
about we um, utilised uh, ice scrapers to spread the fear well and choose well messages. We sent out 2,000 of those. The information booklets that I mentioned before, we distributed 35,000 of those. Um, and we also, as I said, took, under, took 50, over 50 days of engagement work as well. So that's just really a snapshot, um, as I said, of, of the results that we had during the campaign. So just to summarise, there were sort of two key elements to the initiative which contributed to Anfield to the success. The first was bringing together the nine local partners that we had or across the patch and getting them to buy into the campaign theme and execution. And the second was using new technology and social media to drive uh, high levels of reach and engagement, particularly among the 16 to 25 year, year age group. And we also obviously uh, managed to create uh, a fun and impactful animated format. And based on the success of that, we've gone on to do um, a couple of others as well. Uh, we had Dee's Fun in the Sun, which was uh, utilised during a summer campaign. And then last winter, to coincide with the Feeling Under the Weather campaign, we um, had a relative of Dee, her auntie, Winnie, and we uh, produced a, a video around Winnie's Winter Woes, which was to try and promote the um, use of NHS 111, which is one of the key aims of the Feeling Under the Weather campaign. So thank you, and uh, if, I know that questions will be um, given at the end, so thank you for listening. Thank you. So, Dan, that was brilliant. Thank you very much, and um, pretty well on your 10 minutes, which is fabulous. Um, great example of um, a campaign to address A&E and, and make sure people are using it appropriately. So um, can see straight away the impact that would have financially on reducing the costs within A&E. And I'm looking forward to hearing more about Win Winnie's winter woes. Um, so I'd qu quite like to, uh, there was already a question around defining the difference between comms and engagement, and I think that presentation was starting to get to the heart of that. But if anyone would like to answer the question there um, with a little bit more um, information for Tom, that would be great. But um, Kerry, I would now like to hand over to you to talk to us about the work you've been doing in terms of the early resolution in the complaints process and the benefits that you've been seeing at Northern Devon Healthcare Trust. So Kerry, over to you. Thank you very much, Ruth. Um, my name is Kerry Joseph. I'm from the Customer Relations Team at Northern Devon Healthcare Trust. Um, we are an integrated health and social care um, organisation. We have an, a, a small acute hospital and um, 17 community hospitals with the community services and reablement services um, provided within the community. Um, as a team, we, um, as a customer relations team, we obviously work under the Director of Nursing and we are a relatively small team for the size of organisation. We have approximately um, 5,000 staff spread across a wide geographical area. Um, one of the things that we wanted to do um, within the organisation in 2011, um, the acute hospital acquired the community services and we wanted to standardise the complaints process um, across the organisation and bring in some of the good work that had been undertaken with both um, organisations previously and try and bring in um, early resolution right from the start. Um, the way that we did that was that we... Um, for all of our complaints across the organisation now, we verbally acknowledge all of the issues that are received um, and we offer the opportunity of a local resolution meeting at the very outset of our complaints process as an alternative to a written response. Um, obviously, any meetings that are held are followed up with summary notes, but we give the, the person, the patient, the, the service user the option right at the very start um, to control and have an input into how um, their issue is going to be responded to. We've undertaken this now routinely for two and a half years and the impact is that more complaints are resolved first time. We've got improved staff engagement within the complaints process and we fully embedded it across the organisation, taking into account the differences between the acute um, side and the community services. Um, we've been very successful and had um, effective engagement from all of our clinical and non-clinical service manager groups um, and we've been able to improve the patient experience as a result within this time frame. So how do we do it? 
Um, I mentioned there that there's two key um, processes really. The verbal triage process at the beginning is instrumental and really important. So what we do, where possible, we make contact within three working days and talk through the issues with the person so that we're not just interpreting the letter but we're actually identifying exactly what it is that they wish to have resolved. Um, that gives us the opportunity to de-escalate any issues in line with that person's wishes should that be the case um, and more often than not sometimes patients by having had that contact actually don't necessarily want anything dealt with formally and quite welcome the opportunity of speaking with the respective clinical team or service manager to resolve the issue that they've got. We gather information quicker from our nursing and medical staff because we can actually tailor the questions that we're asking them rather than relying on an interpretation of something we've received. Um, it also helps us identify what the resolution is that the person is um, seeking and you know, being able to give them the option to contribute to that by asking them you know, what their desired outcome um, actually is really an effective way of making sure we deal with it properly. Where we're unable to make contact verbally, we will send a standard acknowledgement letter within the time frame that we obviously need to, which is three working days, and we will then ask the person to make contact with us if they so wish. Um, sometimes we're able to make contact proactively, but there are occasions where we can't, and there are some occasions, particularly issues that are received via their parties or solicitors or an advocate whereby approaching the patient or the person directly isn't appropriate and we would obviously do that through that medium. What we find is that actually we now find that we have a low proportion of complaints referred to the Ombudsman because we're actually getting the issues offered um, or identified correctly. As part of that initial correspondence and that initial conversation, we will offer the opportunity of a local resolution meeting with the respective people involved in the issue. Um, we find that's really effective engaging the, the service user right at the very start because it's involving them in how they wish to take the issue um, forward. As with um, the issues that we identify, that formulates into a um, draft agenda for the meeting and that is shared as with the issues of resolution with the person so that they can agree to those issues and amend or um, add if and when that's something that they wish to do. We ensure the right people at the right level attend the meeting depending on the issues that we've pulled through and we provide um, information face to face um, to both our staff and the person attending the meeting to support them through the whole process. With the local resolution meetings, we personally within the organisation provide summary notes to um, those that have attended so that they have that information um, to hand. That is sent with a, with a final letter from our Chief Executive identifying any of the learning that may well have been identified through that resolution meeting. We have had occasions where we provide um, copies of the meeting or the meeting is recorded. Um, and a question that we are asked frequently is, um, you know, whether that's something we undertake routinely. It was, it was a consideration for us. However, the feedback that we've received from those that have attended the meetings since we started introducing them routinely is that they actually prefer the summary notes um, because that's something that they then have with them that they can read and refer back to as and when they need to. There's no issue about them having the right device to be able to play the information on and it also aids them to share the information with any wider family um, in case there are any questions that may arise from that perspective. So one of the questions that we're often asked is how did we achieve it and I quite like this um, sort of um, picture to just demonstrate you know obviously the power really that um, everybody, everybody's voices can have if you get everybody together. So we didn't quite achieve it this way but what we did do is that we um, achieved it successfully through collaborative working with our management teams, our clinical teams. So in terms of the written responses, those that wish not to meet and still wish to receive a written response, we've made them effective and responsive by undertaking that initial triage and really spending time at the beginning to actually identify those issues. We, we work collaboratively with the sort of senior management team and clinical teams and we ensure that the information that we provide is are clear. There's clarity and we focus very much so on learning as we're expected to. But more importantly, we, we take a storytelling approach so we actually enable that the sort of the organisation and the person to recount their experience with the clinical teams um, to actually understand it from start to finish. 
We also have an effective quality checking process within our executive team and our senior management team. So um, any response is reviewed um, by the senior management team of the service concerned. An executive member of the organisation as part of the quality checking before it's then fully reviewed by our chief executive ready for response. Coming back to storytelling, we've really found that's had a really big impact on the quality of our responses. Um, there's a little bit of information there that should have popped up on your screen about narrative leadership and essentially that is about giving people the tools and the techni techniques to take responsibility for making meaning about issues that have happened and actually being able to understand the reasoning behind that in a really clear and effective way. In relation to our resolution meetings, one of the reasons, one of, some of the questions we're asked is why are they so successful? And for us, really, it's, um, it wouldn't be successful if it wasn't for the dedication and the engagement of all of our clinical teams and non-clinical teams across the organisation. They fully embrace this right from the very beginning and are now seeing really um, clear results in terms of how that they can use this within their sort of um, clinical teams, but also how they can resolve issues that are um, raised and possibly move issues forward when it's involving ongoing care. And we have had the resolution meetings help restore um, relationships, clinical patient relationships where they've broken down. More importantly, though, the feedback, the feedback that we get from both sides of the um, process from, from from the patients and from the um, staff is that it actually provides dedicated time to discuss the issues, which particularly on the acute side, um, you know, in busy clinical environments, really does make a big difference to both staff and patients. It promotes the conversation and it also encourages participation and involvement, creating a level playing field and bringing back any sort of distribution of um, consideration that there might be between those involved in that, that episode of care. It also has enabled opportunities to address behaviour and barriers to communication and we successfully had um, a change in a, a particular team whereby we found that there was a pocket of issues that came through um, through the effective use of resolution meetings and sitting down with the patients and hearing it from the patient's perspective, the team were able to um, address and change their approach and interestingly were not aware of the perception of the patients that helped them to really transform that and provide a better experience. There's also the narrative wreckage which links back to the, the narrative leadership which is about helping people move on from difficult situations or difficult circumstances. This really helps where it comes to our um, services around chronic um, care and chronic conditions um, and actually a bit giving people the opportunity to sort of understand the reasoning behind. The practicalities in terms of resolution meetings um, is actually that, you know, organisationally and coming back to the comments that Ruth made about the sort of financial savings is that it did require significant sort of um, commitment from our from the organisation and our clinical teams right from the very start but they embraced that fully um, because they, they understood and recognised the benefits. More time is invested at the outset by undertaking the initial conversations and making sure we get it right and we've got a longer triaging process to identify the issues as a result. Our correct managers and clinicians commit to the time to the meetings. On average, we allow about four hours for a local resolution meeting. That isn't always the time that's required for the clinical staff, but essentially we would always allow for a two-hour meeting um, and then a pre-meet pre, uh, prior to that. The additional time that then is spent is obviously the administrative side for that. We support the meetings through a note taker and the meeting is facilitated by either myself or my colleague within the, within the team. And that's really important to have effective facilitation because it enables us to then be able to ensure that each side of the, the sort of party get the, the best resolution and the best outcome. So one thing we thought would be useful for, it, for you all to see is the statistical side of what this means in practice. So on your screen now you will see some statistics from the financial year 2014-2015 and effectively we are, now, we are now resolving about a quarter of our annual activity through a local resolution meeting. 
you'll see the last bubble there shows a low proportion of requests to the Ombudsman and we prior to that you'll see that a high number of the meetings that took place um, achieved resolution first time round. So bringing that back to you know the sort of the um, the benefits, the benefits realisation in terms of um, taking this this sort of project forward is that actually you get better satisfaction all around and actually you do, you prevent um, long procrastinated issues that spend a long time trying to be resolved and keep coming back and forth. In terms of accountability, um, we monitor the effectiveness of um, this process um, in a number of ways. We've got monthly reports to our trust board and we have a number of key performance indicators that we monitor on an informal basis to make sure that we're obviously offering what we can. We also have to report monthly to our uh, clinical commissioning group and they are and the feedback we've had from them is they're very pleased with the way in which you know we are um, responding and our performance within the team. We also have monthly reporting to our directorates via monthly performance monitoring process and that's really an effective way of getting information back to those sort of service and clinical teams around how well they're doing with res resolving the issues that obviously get brought to um, the organisation's attention. We have quarterly reporting to our learning from patient experience group which is a really um, good platform and um, group that um, we can share the experiences that we have and actually you know we have had feedback from the divisional teams because there's representation from each of our directorates within that group as well as a patient representative so the the progress of the implementation was monitored quite closely through that group and actually it was a, an opportunity to feed in um, the wider collective experiences from the wide range of directorates within our organisation to help improve that process as we went along. We've obviously got our annual report to the Trust Board and that focuses very much on you know, how well we've been able to resolve the issues that we've got um, alongside obviously having the opportunity of showcasing the best practice to um, you know, through the, the Penner Awards and also to other organisations through these types of platforms. We've, I, we thought it would be helpful to display some benefits and testimonials and you'll see here that you know we've, we've actually got feedback from both the patient and managers and essentially it demonstrates that it's well received within all of those um, forums. Particularly um, the consultant, um, we've had a really um, positive engagement from that from those um, clinical teams and sometimes now we find that they actually have the um, confidence and the ability through being coached through um, attending meetings to actually undertake them um, with patients as and when it's necessary rather than waiting for issues to be brought to the attention through our team and then instigate it. So next steps. What do we want to do now? One of the things that we've identified is the really um, effective process of actually having everybody around the table, sitting with the medical notes and actually having um, an open and um, frank discussion around elements of care. One of the things we want to do in the short term is now extend that approach to um, bringing a, bring in a multidisciplinary approach for multiple complaints and actually get the complaints leads and the clinicians around the table um, internally to actually go through the patient's care pathway and pull together um, detailed and um, coherent responses where there are multiple services or multiple directorates. We want to increase the power's presence on the wards and actually as part of the success of implementing the, the project and seeing the benefits we've actually been able to um, uh, get commitment to additional members of staff to, to actually um, take the sort of the, the um, focus and the structure of a local resolution meeting to the wards at the time that patients are in patients or maybe um, to within the community teams to actually resolve the issues before you know individuals feel the opportunity of putting pen to paper. Longer term we want to um, undertake more investigations possibly centrally within the team. There was a, another organisation that um, was a runner-up as we were within National Awards and they have effectively changed the culture within their mental health trust by taking a more central um, approach to investigations and providing further support to the, the divisional and clinical teams as a result. Um, there's a thought process of whether we use um, the governance leads within the directorates um, for more 
um, increased roles within the investigation and further integration of those um, governance realms where possible to just strengthen and bring in some consistency around our investigations. And that's me. And hopefully, um, if there's any questions, please ask me at the end. Um, and hopefully, um, that information has provided you with um, an overview of what we've been doing. Fabulous. Thank you. Thank you, Kerry, for, for taking us through that and for sharing your work. Um, and um, it is interesting because, of course, there are savings all over the place and you alluded to some of those. Um, I know people will have questions, um, so please do send those questions through or you have, um, as you can see on this slide, you've got the, twi the, the Twitter handles on the bottom left-hand side of the screen if you want to catch up directly. I think um, as time's pressing, let's move quickly on to Joe, also known as Andrew for today, um, from the Ipswich Hospital NHS Trust to talk to us about um, the work that they've been doing at um, Ipswich around staff engagement. So Andrew, I'm going to hand over very quickly to you um, to take us through that. Andrew. Thanks very much indeed, Ruth, and thanks everybody for being with us today. Um, I'm sorry that I'm not Joe Wood. I'm going to do my best. Joe is Head of Organisational Development of the Ipswich Hospital NHS Trust. Um, I look after Captive Health. Um, we wrote a joint presentation for a joint entry to the awards this year, um, and this is, uh, this is that presentation. So I'm going to do my best not to mislead you. You're in safe hands. I was a Head of Organisational Development myself for the country's largest social work employer before I stepped into the NHS as Head of Patient Experience. So I'll try and uh, do my best for you today. So we um, are, so just cap, uh, Ipswich Hospital is a, a large acute trust, 552 beds over a massive site. Um, the site is important in this context uh, because lots of staff spend lots of time moving around the site and on the go. Um, that would be similar if you were a community provider. Um, and uh, on this site, um, that's a big feature in why we did what we did in this example. Um, over 3,500, nearly 4,000 people employed by the Trust, and we think that something like 60 to 70 percent of those don't sit at a computer every day. So that leads to interesting comms challenges in terms of how we access those people, how we influence those people, how we give them the tools they need to do their job. In terms of us, we're an ethical company uh, dedicated to helping NHS organisations improve outcomes. Uh, we see ourselves as a pooled resource. Each client chips in uh, to the development project and we create something extraordinary that uh, they couldn't, um, but they, 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 they want but couldn't create themselves. So our kit faces both staff and patients and we had an earlier session looking at the patient side of what we do as we were shortlisted in multiple categories at this year's awards. You can see more about us on our website. All our development is client-led. So the context here for this project, um, about 85% of the UK of UK employees would be happy to use their own device at work. So that leads us into an interesting place in terms of a secure platform, keyword there, secure platform, where we can create a new comms channel for our staff, for, for communicating with our staff. Um, Standards of communication tend to be set outside of work. Um, we've all worked in organizations, public sector organizations, where the reputation of IT systems probably isn't as good as it could be among staff. Maybe we get a better experience outside of work than we do at work in terms of how slick the systems are. Many people will find that familiar. So Staff Connect tries to change that. Um, it helps you raise a profile, connect in new ways with your staff, and lots of benefits there that we will explore. It's packed with functionality, comes with a staff portal, with a control panel where communications can be scheduled and uh, content managed. That content includes the content of the staff app. So it was the staff app that was submitted for an award at this year's awards and was shortlisted and joint submission between the Ipswich Hospital and Cats Health because we, we really built it together. Um, 
the staff app, the version one, the first version of staff app was developed you know, with Ipswich and with you know, significant input from staff across the organisation. Um, and uh, we uh, we had a whole session, um, a whole webinar on the the, the innovation side of that. Um, so I'm just going to go and focus, get, just focus down on some of the benefits of the product itself um, for this session. So what were the aims of those project? Of, of what were the aims of that project? Um, I suppose two questions there really. One that we asked staff, which was, you know, what information do you want in your pockets? What's going to be useful to you? And the product had to respond to the "what's in it for me" question. Otherwise, people wouldn't use it. Uh, it'd be pointless developing something that people then, then don't go on and use. And the other question was, well, what information is going to make your make you more efficient um, when you're out and about when you're doing your job? So, listed some of the benefits there on screen. Effectively, the aim of the project was to improve staff engagement by providing the team with an alternative way to access relevant, up-to-date knowledge and information. So we're going to have a little look at what the product is and what it does. Um, this is provided in software as a service format, which means that you can pick that code up and provide it to any organization in the NHS. So it's scalable as well as delivering big efficiencies, um, being very affordable to uh, NHS organizations. So. This is uh, just one of the screens on the app. It's, uh, it shows that we're a value-driven organization, that we value our staff. And really, the product embodies that, um, becomes a, a totem pole for staff engagement. Um, we include in the product a list of benefits. Why did we do this? We did this because when we were speaking to staff at the hospital about you know, particularly new joiners, and we're asking them you know, what it was like and what their needs were when they first joined the organization. Um, some of them were, were saying, you know, there's, a, there's almost a shame um, attached to asking my manager about the employee benefits, and they feel they're missing out on those. So bringing those really to the forefront to make them accessible has a big impact. It gets people up and running quickly, and it enables them to share in the pride that we all have to work in the NHS. Um, vacancies. On the product, this puts vacancies in people's pockets. We're just releasing an upgrade that enables people to see alerts when a new job, new vacancy is added. Um, this uh, includes document management systems, so we can actually you know, get job descriptions and all those sorts of things to people. They can share those, send them to themselves, send them to colleagues. This is publicly available and accessible, as well as accessible to those people um, who are registered users as members of staff within the trust. So that is a vehicle for boosting employer branding as well. People have joined then. Uh, there's a virtual tour available. In fact, there are multiple virtual tours. So you know, within the control panel, we can set up as many client Ipswich Hospital can set up as many tours as they like. Um, this enables people to start their induction before they even join, to get a feel for the site if they're thinking about applying for a job. Um, but particularly if you think about you know, the needs of different staff groups, you know, we could have a different virtual tour for, say, junior doctors as compared to um, allied health professionals or nurses, etc. So you know, what would you want to know before you start in your new role if you're a junior doctor coming to it? So that kind of thing. Those are the sorts of questions that we answer with this. Each of those map icons then launches the information page, and you can have as many of those as you like. The icons are all, all tailored and managed in the control panel. So part of the what's in it for me question is enabling staff to find colleagues' information anywhere, anytime. So a nice secure platform here for um, the who's who, the staff list. Um, this means that I can, when I'm out and about and across that, you know, big um, and uh, um, uh, spread out site, I can get hold of people's information wherever I happen to be, if I'm at a meeting. Staff find this hugely beneficial. So you know, that simple feature on its own uh, makes the whole project worthwhile. Um, another you know, real bonus here that staff love, and particularly frontline managers love this feature, is around um, providing performance information policies, procedures, uh, KPIs, um, team bites, and cascading those. Um, do you want to ask uh, your questions that you've uh, you've presented? Yeah, sure. Thank you. First of all, thank you very much for the opportunity. That's really really useful. Um, I work for the Cumbria Partnership Trust uh, up here at the northern end of England. And um, we're looking at ways that we can uh, communicate and engage more effectively with um, our staff. The dispersed workforce in a very rural setting. 
So um, what we always find interesting is when we look at um, the results of surveys, for example, the NHS survey about communication and engagement, it's almost like we're comparing apples with oranges because you know, if you're in an acute setting and you've got maybe one or two sites and you want to create awareness amongst uh, a particular audience, you can do that very quickly in theory. We've got you know, 100 plus sites spread over you know, the whole of this huge, it's the second largest county in the country, and it's really difficult communicating and engaging. And so I wanted to really throw a couple of questions in the air. One was, do we, do we think that there's a difference, a meaningful difference between communication and engagement, or are they just, as, as we think, points on the same continuum? And you know, how is it different for an organization like us in a rural setting than it might be for someone in an urban setting? Did that make sense? Tom, I, I've actually um, using this tool. I've actually sent you a response back. I don't know if you've seen that, but I, I'm happy to articulate. So um, I've said there is a difference, and I was going to say that the it's that communications are the tools and messages to reach various audiences, and engagement is about working with patients and members of the public to put them, to put them at the centre of the work that we do. And interestingly, since we've had our merger um, with Gem. The, to reflect the focus of the majority of the work that we do, our team name has changed. So previously, it was comms and engagement, and now it's engagement in communications and marketing, because we know that a lot of the work that we do really centers around engagement, and then from some of that engagement then comes out further communication. So it might be that we're working with a particular group, and as a result of that, what we then want to do is produce particular materials as a, as a simplistic, simplistic example. But to answer your other question as well, is um, which I think was around um, rural. Um, let me just go back. And you talked about differences about delivering comms ac across rural versus urban trusts. So within Warwickshire, we have a, a rural north uh, and a not so rural south, uh, and then quite a built-up urban metropolis in the centre, which is Coventry. Yeah. Um, and we work across all of those th different terrains as such to try and deliver comms across them. But it is different and it is, it's difficult because obviously of the different areas that you're dealing with. But part of that means that you have to get out there and you have to speak with the different, different groups that you're looking to do. And it's not simple enough to say, well, for, in terms of engagement, we're going to have a particular event in Coventry because we know that we're going to get that sort of backlash. So instantly, if we're talking about doing a particular event, my kind of hand goes up and says, right, well, we need to get right up to the north and we need to go right down to the south and we need to cover as wide a demographic as possible. But I think it, from what you're saying, it is something that you really need to work at in terms of trying to make sure that you're reaching as wide an audience as possible. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know if it helps, but we're sort of unique with our organisation because we're both sort of, in terms of having the acute trust and then the community service, we sort of cover both. And, you know, obviously I think the challenges that you're seeing, I think, are seen across both, um, you know, sort of um, the acute sort of confined environment as well as the community. And I guess it's about the quality of the communication and the message that's obviously being um, sent and whether it's, you know, the, the approach against um, all of those teams. So for me, uh, the way I, in my mind, the way that I see it is that communication is around getting the message out, engagement is around having those recipients and um, owning whatever that piece of communication is. And certainly within, you know, the project that we undertook is that, you know, we made it quite clear the sort of the, the sort of benefits that we would see from actually undertaking this piece of work. But it wouldn't have worked had we not got the full engagement from those all of the varying teams that we cover. Um, mm. So for me, I sort of feel that that's certainly from our experience, the difference, um, whilst they go, you know, they're intertwined, they go hand in hand, actually, you know, you could look at them as two sort of um, separate entities with two different um, purposes, but interlinked. Mm. Okay, thank you. Um, I have a very quick question for Kerry, um, and I, I know you tr touched on this a little bit, but I wanted to understand a bit more about the verbal triage. Mm-hmm. Anything in How particular? That works. Do you have any? Do you have any specific questions? Do you have a framework that you approach? I was just interested to know how structured your triage was. 
Um, yes, we do have a sort of framework that we apply, but obviously um, each individual case is unique, so to speak. So what we do is we spend time with the person discussing the issues that they've raised. That, that our personal approach is to ask them to go through um, the issues that they are unhappy about, because um, my experience is more often than not you identify additional issues that you may have from the letter that's in front of you. And just really sort of from a coaching perspective, you know, talk the person through their experience and sort of um, start with those sort of like inquiring questions around, you know, what happened during those different stages, um, you know, if it's appropriate how that made that person um, feel, then ultimately um, end the sort of conversation with trying to ha ask the individual to think about the issues that they would like resolved and what outcomes they're looking for and spending mm -hmm. some time recounting what they've told you so that you've got that joint understanding um, and then obviously the follow-up that we um, undertake from that by then writing to the individual confirming the issues that we've identified just then makes that part of the process a bit more seamless and then everybody is working from the same starting point um, which gives us the best opportunity to um, achieve the best outcome in the end. Cool, thank you. Thank you, Kerry. And I think one of the questions, you, one of the comments you made there is, is probably one of the most powerful which is asking people what they want um, yes. but finding the right tone and way to ask that because some people can feel that's quite a flippant comment. Yes, actually, that's at the heart often of what you're trying to get to, which is really what what are you what are you hoping to achieve through complaining? And often it's just acknowledgement and the time to to be heard, isn't it? Absolutely, and it's also about giving people the opportunity of being in control of that. So rather than mm -hmm. them feeling that they're having to put pen to paper and then absolving that responsibility and waiting for somebody else to respond and, and take on that responsibility, it's actually it's, it's, it's engaging them and bringing them really into the core to actually so that they can have an influence and an impact of how that issue is taken forward for them. Mm, brilliant, thank you. Um, and we're, we're virtually at time, I think. And I have just one final um, comment, which was Dan was um, offering to share the film about Dee and the A&E fail tale um, and also the work about Winnie. Dan, how do we get to hear more about that? How do we get to, to find out how we do that? Um, I mean, the, the um, all the videos are on our YouTube channel, but if people wanted to, I mean, I think my... Um, the Twitter accounts for both Arden and Jem and myself are, um, were on the presentation. If people want to contact me that way, then that's fine, and we can have a conversation about those. Um, or did you? It's, it's up to individuals, really. I'm happy to sort of get, take emails. I can share my email address with people if they want to get in touch that way. Just, just a quick reminder: the webinars will go up, so you can see the see, see and hear the recordings um, with the slides. I would like to thank our speakers today, and uh, but I would like to thank NHS IQ and um, Picker also for supporting us as well as our brilliant speakers today. So on that note, I'd like to wish you a great afternoon. Thank you very much for joining us, and uh, join us on the third of November for our last webinar. Thank you very much. Bye-bye, everyone.